Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar on the role of foreign direct investment in the Irish economy, co-organized with the OECD and IDA Ireland. The event today marks the launch of the OECD's FDI Qualities Assessment of Ireland report, which looks at the impact of foreign investment over a 10-year time horizon starting in 2006. The report, which does not include the pandemic period, was used as input into the formulation of the IDA's latest four-year strategy, which was published earlier this month. For your convenience, a link to the OECD report has been emailed to you all in the past half an hour. During today's event, Martin Shannon, who is CEO of IDA Ireland, and Anna Novick, head of the investment decision of the Directorate for Financial and Enterprise Affairs at the OECD, will open proceedings. Then Martin Ver Vermelinger, who is project manager and economist at the OECD investment decision, will present the findings of the report. Following that, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once the panelists have finished their presentations. A reminder that today's presentations and Q&A are both on the rack record. So with that, uh, welcome Martin Shanahan and over to you. Thanks Dan, uh, to you and uh, Michael and the team at IEA for hosting us uh, today. Uh, welcome to our uh, OECD colleagues, Anna and Martin, uh, whom I'm very much uh, looking forward to, to listening to and thank them of course for their work on uh, this report. Thanks also to, also to my IDA colleagues, particularly Kieran Donoghue and Neil Brady, for their input into uh, this report uh, being launched today, and of course uh, in helping to organise today's uh, event. Um, the IDA commissioned uh, this report as one of the inputs to inform uh, our new strategy, which we launched on the 6th of January. Uh, we believe that it's important that we continue to hold uh, a mirror up to ourselves and uh, gain a detailed understanding of what is happening within our client uh, base. That's not always uh, as easy as it seems, uh, and I think as our uh, colleagues from the OECD will attest, as typically one is firstly looking uh, backwards, uh, the data set um, of necessity that the OECD used predates the COVID uh, pan pandemic and indeed much of our, our recent strategy uh, and of course Irish international data set sets are uh, limited but I believe that the OECD have done an excellent job. Uh, they have reaffirmed some of the things that we already uh, knew and provided much greater insight into what's happening uh, within the uh, client portfolio. Uh, I think those things that the study has reaffirmed, uh, reaffirmed include that Ireland is one of the most open economies in the world and that the FDI uh, base of companies deeply integrates Ireland's economy into global value chains. The report shows that IDA supported firms are concentrated in sectors uh, that exhibited rapid growth and are associated with higher productivity, R&D expenditure and um, wages and salaries. Uh, we were aware, I think, from previous uh, work by the CSO, OECD, uh, ESRI, and indeed the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, that there is a significant and growing productivity gap between FDI in Ireland and domestic firms in Ireland. But this new research also shows, I think, the range uh, within the IDA portfolio and uh, between uh, pro um, productivity frontier companies and other companies uh, that operate uh, in Ireland. Uh, I think the report shows that FDI in Ireland is, is resilient, uh, while the analysis um, pre, uh, predates COVID-19, as you mentioned in your intro, it shows that FDI was uh, key for Ireland to recover from uh, another big economic crisis, the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. And while it is, I think, too early to say what will happen post-COVID, uh, uh, we already know from the IDEA results for 2020 that sectors in which IDA supported firms are concentrated, exhibited a remarkable resilience during 2020, particularly in areas like pharmaceuticals, IT, medical technologies, international financial services. Uh, in 2020, 20,000 new jobs were created within the portfolio. And when you net out losses, we saw employment uh, in the portfolio uh, grow by uh, close to 9,000 jobs, which I think is a remarkable performance by companies in a year where they were dealing with a global pandemic. The report uh, rightly points to concentration risk, uh, both in terms of 
sector, the origins of the FDI that's attacked here, and uh, regional uh, dispersion. I think there are. Um, Firstly, if you are uh, if you're going to be concentrated, it's better to be concentrated in the most highly productive and resilient sectors that we believe underpin a modern economy, uh, and I believe that's where we are. Um, we also have to acknowledge that, given our geographic location, uh, the size of our market, the availability of raw materials, there are limitations on what sectors we can compete in. That does not detract from the macroeconomic concentration risk, but makes it all the more important that we continue to do the right things from a policy pers perspective and to be uh, successful in those sectors. It also means that we have to focus on uh, diversifying within those sectors. And that is why you will see areas like cybersecurity, ATMPs, connected and autonomous vehicles, to mention but a few, identified in the new strategy as areas that we will uh, focus on. Secondly, uh, the issue of diversification featured heavily in IDA's strategy from 2015 to 2019. And I believe that the data from that, that time period will show that we have made progress on diversification of source markets. From 2015 to 2019, our focus on Europe and Asia PAC has seen the North American share uh, decline. Uh, although uh, it increased slightly again actually in the past year due to our focus on the existing client base, which as we know is dominated um, by US companies. Thirdly, uh, IDA has been completely focused on winning uh, regional investments since 2014. I think we've made good progress on that front. Uh, all targets in the last strategy were surpassed with increases in all regions um, outside of Dublin of over uh, 30%. Uh, 67,000 uh, new jobs were created, growth within the portfolio, um, and leading to a 37,500 net increase over the past six years. Uh, so a, a real focus, obviously, on, on the regions in the past uh, strategy. And that continued focus will be central to our new strategy as well, uh, as was set out. Um, IDA uh, launched that new strategy, which runs from 21 to 24 at the beginning of January. Uh, it builds around five interlinked pillars of growth, transformation, regions, sustainability, and impact. And uh, the findings of this report you will see uh, intertwined in those uh, uh, strategic responses and underpinning those. Um, IDA will continue to diversify its source markets. We will continue to seek to drive regional investment in line with the national planning framework, uh, despite the obvious challenges which are pointed out by the OECD in this report that we have only one international city of scale, uh, Dublin. We will work with our clients to help them drive productivity. Uh, and again, uh, you know, when Martin goes through his presentation later, you'll see the, the obvious need for that. And um, we will do that through investment in R&D, digitization, industry 4.0 initiatives. initiatives. And we're clear that you know, COVID has hastened the technological tsunami that was heading at us in any event, and um, you know, which has made it all the more important that we uh, respond. Uh, and this is an issue for many clients within uh, our uh, portfolio. And we know that uh, it is the most productive firms that survive. And again, I think uh, Martin's work underlines that. So um, again, important that we undertake those initiatives. We will also work with other agencies and particularly Enterprise Ireland to build clustering opportunities to accelerate the spillover effects from FDI to SMEs and uh, the report uh, today obviously comments on the spillover effects that are at play within the Irish environment. And we will support companies in their sustainability efforts in the widest possible sense uh, aligned to the UN sustainability goals and specifically within that we have a focus on the green economy and carbon reduction. Uh, important uh, in the midst of uh, this is that we don't lose sight, I suppose, of the um, key high level objective of growing foreign direct investment for the benefit of the people of Ireland. Uh, as has never been so evident as it has been in the past year, Ireland is heavy, heavily dependent on FDI in terms of high quality employment, exports and the economic contribution uh, to the exchequer. To remind you of some of the numbers in that regard, uh, there are over, uh, tw there's over 25 billion in uh, FDI expenditure in the economy on payroll Irish materials and services uh, as a result of foreign direct investment. 
In addition, annual capital expenditure by multinationals has averaged between around 5 and 7 billion over the last number of years, and in 2019 was uh, 7.2 billion. FDI, uh, as we know, has had a significant impact on the national accounts uh, in terms of corporation tax paid with over 70% coming from multinational companies. And I think importantly, this contribution continues during the course of uh, 2020 and, and much needed, obviously. And, and similarly with income tax paid uh, by those employed in the multinational sector has proved very resilient over the uh, past year. 68% of all exports that leave the country come from FDI. And of course, there are 257,000 people now employed directly in multinationals, not to mention the indirect employment that um, comes from there. Uh, so given the cost of COVID and with unemployment hovering around 20%, uh, FDI's role uh, will be crucial. I hand back to you, Dan. Many thanks, Martin. Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Dan, and thanks also the, uh, the Institute for International European Affairs for hosting this lunch. In another occasion, we will be all in Ireland, but uh, in this occasion, we are in Beardful. I also want to thank uh, you, Martin uh, Chanhan, and all your agency, because it's, it's true that this uh, launch of the FDA Quality Assessment of Ireland is thanks to this partnership that we have built uh, in, this, uh, in this collaboration. The launch of the record is taking place in a very special moment. The global foreign direct investment has slowed down significantly. We know already that dropping more by probably 40% at the end of the year, we are calculating the, the last uh, numbers. Uh, the COVID pandemic is still a public health emergency and uncertainty will likely affect international investment also in 2021. On the other hand, Countries are already taking significant steps to speed up the recovery and FBI can play an important role. And I think that this is the reason of the strategy that Martin mentioned. In this context, the launch of the report is timely because better understanding the contribution of FBI in Ireland is key to strengthen the role of international investment for an inclusive and sustainable recovery. Today, the report examines the impact of foreign direct investment attracted to Ireland over the period of 2006-16, as was mentioned by Dan, and provide an overview of the direct contribution and spillover effect of this investment on the local economy. The report includes four chapters. Martin will go through them, but the first one is about FDI in Ireland, the trade and global value chain integration. The second is about FDI productivity and labor market outcomes. The third is about multinational productivity dynamics. And the four is about factor driving spillover from the FDI in Ireland. Among small open economies, Ireland has at near top of class over the past four decades in terms of attracting FDI. Ireland's multinational sector has gone from strength to strength, helping underpin the economies take off in the, in the 90s, cushioning the blow of the economy crash in 2008, and supporting its rapid recovery over the past decade and ensuring remarkable resilience uh, that's during this COVID-19 period. However, echoing some of the concern flag in the also 2020 OECD economic survey of Ireland, there is a large productivity gap between foreign-owned and local-owned firm in the Irish economy with foreign firm in key sector like chemical, computer, electronic, and optical products sourcing less than 10% of their material domestically. As it, uh, we will see that emerge also from the OECD report that we are launching today, more can be done to increase background linkage and enable positive spillover. The report has been jointly developed by the OECD and IDA Ireland and builds on OECD work under the FDA Quality Initiative. A first steering group meeting was held in December 28, uh, sorry, 2018, and the final report was submitted at the fall of 2018. We didn't, we were not able to launch it before because of the COVID and also uh, some of general election in Ireland. In this, in this context, as, as Dan mentioned at the beginning, the analysis predate the COVID-19 pandemic and does not take into account of the impact of this crisis on foreign investment in Ireland. Nevertheless, the report has provided important background research and analysis as input to the development of the IDA 
uh, island's new strategy, which has been, as mentioned by Martin, launched rec recently. And we are very, very impressed by this release strategy. Uh, we really believe that this focus on the areas which are the great importance for the work undertaking under the Investment Promotion Agency, work stream on the OECD, and it's, as mentioned by Martin in the strategy when you presented, it's really tackle the topics that uh, we also detected in the report are key for the sustainable recovery. We are delighted to see that the result of the study have informed the new strategy. We are also pleased to see an explicit interest of the IDA airline in continuing engaging with us, particularly in the context of the FDA quality initiative, which aim to enhance the impact of FDI on inclusive and sustainable growth. And also in the context of the investment promotion agency network that we have in the OECD. We are currently following uh, this uh, FDA quality initiative uh, in the second phase. In the second phase, the idea is to develop a quality policy toolkit in four clusters, productivity and innovation, job and skill, gender and low carbon. And uh, we are identifying the policy option and the institution. And, uh, and I think that the work that we've done in this report, it's a, it's a signal of a first seed of this kind of work because exactly we are trying to also link policies with institution and mixing institution. That is something that we did here. Um, we are also hosting the OECD investment promotion uh, uh, network in the OECD and IDA Island is part of our steering group member. And uh, upcoming topics are very similar to the one that Martin mentioned and are part of the strategy, the idea of how to increase the impact of their activities and sustainable development. I mean that we are very glad to know that this is part of a strategy because we will also be make this issue as an important part of, uh, of the IPA network in the OECD. Before close, closing this opening remark, allow me to thank the team who worked in this report. The report is a result of a fruitful collaboration between the OECD team, Maria Borja, Cecilia Caliandro, Leticia Montiari, Martin Wermelinger, and Idea Ireland team, Miami Roddy, Tim Costello, Kieran Donegue, chair of the steering committee. The work has, was also enabled thanks to Alexander Crockery, who respond to our IPA network. Uh, I would like to thank again the Institute, Dan, you, and of course IDA for this good collaboration. Many thanks for that, Anna. Uh, so now in terms of presenting the uh, substance of the report, uh, Martin and Paris, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan, for hosting the launch and for giving me the floor. Martin Shanahan, congratulations for such a progressive IDA strategy that you have put out here earlier in January, which is actually greatly aligned, as, as Anna already mentioned, with OECD's priorities on investment and sustainable development. I hope everyone in, on this call is actually keeping safe during the current challenging times, like fast rising, fast rising uh, COVID cases in Ireland earlier in January are really worrisome, so I hope everyone is safe. I'm glad to present some of our key insights of our FDI qualities assessment of Ireland, which is not an easy task in just 15 minutes, given the many findings that have been put together by, by the team in, in the joint effort with IDA. Next slide, please. So this report is framed on our still young but growing FDI qualities initiative, which aims to measure FDI impacts on the SDG outcomes. And as Anna mentioned before, we are now moving this agenda on FDI qualities more towards a policy agenda. So we're trying to develop an FDI qualities policy toolkit over the next two years with guidance on policy and institutional arrangements to maximize FDI impact. And we're looking forward to continue working with IDA on this matter. The report today is uh, looking at the direct contribution of FDI as well as spillover potential of FDI on the Irish economy. And listening to Martin, Janaha, not me, as to how our report supported the development of the IDA's new strategy and seeing the many references in the strategy document to this report and the Qualities Initiative is not only an honor for us, but it also highlights from one of the most successful IPA in the world, how important evidence-based policy discussions can actually be. So thank you very much for this cooperation. Next slide, please. Let me now upfront put out some of the key takeaways of the report and some of them have already been mentioned by, by, 
by both Martin and Anna. And I think the first one is really that it is no secret that the FDI has been a driver of growth in Ireland. But it is important to highlight here that it does so, including and particularly during very challenging times. Our analysis predates the ongoing pandemic, as, as was mentioned, but it shows really that FDI was key for Ireland to recover from another big economic crisis, the Great Recession of 27 to 9. So that's a first very important uh, insight here. The second one is FDI in Ireland has been remarkably resilient during the current economic crisis, which of course supports all the resilience of the wider economy in Ireland. Recent IDA results show that sectors in which IDA supported foreign firms are concentrated exhibited remarkable resilience in 2020, and this includes medical goods, IT services, just to mention a few. Now, the third point is, I think, also fair to say that Ireland's FDI success story is really the result of IDA's targeted promotion efforts. But not only that, it's also an existing coordination effort of IDA with other agencies, such as the Science Foundation Ireland and, and Enterprise Ireland, as well as many supportive government policies and actions of other stakeholders, including the investors themselves. So it's a, a joint effort. And we're really glad to read in the strategy that such cooperation and coordination efforts are going to be strengthened in the coming years, which is really a key recommendation that is coming out of our FDI qualities work and, and more than 35 OECD investment policy reviews undertaken so far. So coordination across agencies is very important. Next slide, please. On this slide, you, you really have a summary of the higher level conclusions of the report, but let me now go through some of them in a bit more details in, in the following slides. So next slide, please. So the first big topic that we cover is the, the role of FDI for Ireland's globalization and integration in global value chains. And next slide, please. I think it's clear, and, and Martin said it, Ireland is one of the most open economies and its FDI base really deeply integrates Ireland's economy in global value chains. On this figure here, you can see three indicators, basically. One is export orientation of a country. Second one is the level of integration in global value chains. And the third one is the presence of foreign multinationals as a share of national GDP. And I think the first insight here is really that you see very clearly a positive relationship. So if one indicator is high, the other two are high as well. So there seems to be some relationship. Second insight is really that you see Ireland is on the left here. It's on the, on the higher side, if you want. So Ireland is first, it has really the, the highest share in domestic value added coming from foreign investors. It is the second highest um, export-oriented country in the OECD, and also Ireland is deeply integrated in GVC. So this relationship comes out very clearly in, in this finding here. Next slide, please. I would now like to highlight two additional key insights from our work in GVCs in Ireland. And, and I think the first one is, is related to the second bullet point here. And it's really the question about what is Ireland's comparative advantage? You may be familiar with, with the smile curve concept of a value chain where you have pre-production services on the left, which includes our research, production design and development and post-production services on the right, such as marketing, distribution, after sales and, and, and publishing, which generate a lot of value added in the value chain. While product assembly, the physical production, which is a more standardized task, uh, generates on average less value added as a task. So we show in the report that FDI operations in Ireland and the export success of Ireland is, is really positioned at the customer end of supply chain. So on the right in, in terms of value added post-production services. And I think related to that um, is the fact, and, and this is also something that Martin mentioned, is the highly concentrated FDI in terms of its origins, in terms of its sources. In 2017, more than 70% of FDI came from the United States. So what does that mean? So many American investors in Ireland use Ireland as a location for production, post-production services 
to enter the European market of exports. Let me go to the next slide and the last finding, which is key in terms of the, the GVC integration, which relates to the profits. Profits make a really a significant contribution of foreign affiliates value added in Ireland. And, and why is that important? And, and basically, just to mention, like the yellow part here is, is showing ex profits value added in terms of profits that is exported out of Ireland. And it's important because profits of foreign investors, they may not stay in Ireland. And thus the benefits of such value added being created in Ireland may not stay. And so the value added is small in a way. So that's of course an important concern, but we need to, to acknowledge that IDA's efforts here to retain investors and to make them expand operations in Ireland through reinvested earnings has been very successful. And again, I think it remains a top priority in the new strategy, which we find appropriate and, 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 and impressive. So let me go to the, the next topic, the next slide, please. So here we focus very much on the direct impact of FDI on production, on innovation and on employment outcomes. And and let me focus on, on this graph first. Like the, the figure shows very impressively that in Ireland, four firms accounted for 60% of value added in 2015. So that's the highest in the European Union. And actually the share of employment at around 18% is, is much lower. And in many EU countries, that share is also lower. So what does that tell us? It's not negative <laughs> that the employment is lower because it does still generate a lot of employment. But we, what it does really show is that in Ireland, foreign firms are operating at the highest levels of productivity in, in Europe. And, and we can also show in our analysis that labor productivity growth of foreign firms has been impressive at about 11% annually over the study period. And this is largely driven by key sectors like information and communication, manufacturing, finance, and insurance. And particularly on manufacturing, it's important to say again that, that um, it is largely driven by a shift from physical production, like away from physical production assembly, more towards services activities, as I have already mentioned before when I talked about comparative advantage. I think another important point here is really uh, regional uh, concentration. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Dublin remains the FDI hub in Ireland. 40% of value added, 40% of employment were generated, um, like of total foreign operations were generated in, in Dublin in 2016. But there are also the other 60%. <laughs> and I think it's again fair to say that Ireland has, uh, IDA has been very successful to, to shift and in, enhance this, this 60% and, and bring more and more investments into the regions uh, in Ireland. And, and I think, again, we, we think it's, it's, it's right to, to, to have that as a, an important priority in the new strategy as well. Next slide, please. So now, just a few more facts uh, on, on direct contributions. I mean, FDI really is concentrated in sectors that are higher, have higher productivity. They have also, it's also in sectors that have higher business expenditures on R&D and also better employment outcomes. So employment growth in those sectors where FDI is concentrated is, is higher and, and wages are also higher, which is kind of a proxy for, for the level of skills in these sectors. It's also important to mention that most R&D, business R&D is conducted by foreign firms in Ireland and this has, has materialized into important innovation outcomes, outputs as well, such as patents. So we can show that 80% of all patents that have been granted in Ireland have been granted to foreign affiliates. So all this is essentially to say that IDA's approach to target high performing activities and sectors is successful. And, and I think it's good to, to continue that while of course diversification in within these activities is also very important. Next slide, please. I would like to now emphasize some very novel work that we have put into the paper, which, which is uh, quite technical, but it's about productivity dynamics of foreign firms in Ireland. And 
there really the question that we're asking is about are all foreign firms the same in terms of their productivity performance in Ireland? And we, I don't think it comes as a surprise, but the answer is no. So we actually see a lot of um, substantial differences and growing differences across foreign firm productivity in, in Ireland. And when you look at this graph here, we see the red line, which is the 95 percentile uh, of the productivity distribution in Ireland over time, showing a growing curve. So that means all firms that are really at the top, at the frontier of, uh, of the productivity ladder are growing in terms of productivity, but it also shows that all others, like starting from the 75 percentile, which you also see as a line here, are multiple times lower. And actually, we don't see so much dynamics in terms of productivity growth of the lower percentile levels here. So a very important frontier in Ireland in terms of foreign firms, and also quite a dynamic frontier, while a little bit less dynamics um, at the lower productivity ladders. Next slide, please. I, I won't have the, the time to, to really go into all the details of this analysis here, but I think overall, what I would like to mention is that there is less churn in Ireland compared to the international evidence. So we see less exits, like less foreign firms that exit the market uh, than, in other, than in other countries and the very high resilience at the top. Very sticky firms that have been there over a long time that are the most productive in Ireland. Of course, we would see some more dynamics uh, when we go into the sectors and I'm happy to go back to that in the discussion. Next slide, please. So now I, I would like to, to spend some time on the third important area covered in the report, which is about spillovers. Um, we, we do really assess three elements of that to kind of assess what is the potential for spillovers in, in Ireland. And the first one is related to capabilities gap between Irish firms and foreign MMEs. And of course, this will, will give us an indication on the ability of the domestic firms to adapt new technologies, technologies of foreign firms, and then benefit from the foreign firm presence. And so if the gap is lower, not so wide, um, it would see more likely to, to see kind of benefits for the domestic firms in terms of productivity. The second issue that we look at is related to, to buy and sell linkages between foreign and domestic firms. Do we really see these two types of firms engaging with each other? And, if, and evidence has shown if, if we have higher linkages, this will also drive the productivity levels of the domestic uh, economy, of the domestic firms. The third element that we're looking at is labor mobility. Of course, if you have foreign, if you have labor that moves from foreign affiliates to the domestic economies, it's also likely that they bring some knowledge to the domestic firms that can have an impact on, the, on, on those firms. So let me go through, through, through these three elements. So first on capabilities, we see that across sectors, we see significant gaps between foreign firms and domestic firms in terms of, in terms of productivity. And that's something that I think both that Anna and Martin have mentioned at the beginning. We see here that gap is particularly high in chemicals in food and in computer and electronics equipment. Although in chemicals, we have to mention that the domestic sector is actually not that big in Ireland. Uh, according to our analysis, and, and the contrary, in the food sector, the foreign sector is not that big. So, of course, that also needs to be taken into account when we do this type of analysis. What is not on the graph, but is also very important, is that the capa capabilities gap is also fairly high uh, when we look into the region. So, when and the productivity gap between foreign firms and domestic firms in the south and east, for example, is, is particularly high. And why is that important? Well, actually, existing evidence shows that when IPAs try to attract FDI into the regions, and, and they're trying to do so not to attract the, the, fr the frontier firms, not the most productive lead firms in the world, 
but actually more firms at the second order where the, the capabilities gap may not be as high, they're very successful. And I think some of these considerations have been discussed with IDA and have made their way also a little bit into the strategy. But uh, again, it would be nice to, to, to have a discussion on that maybe um, later. Now on linkages, next slide, please. Um, we, we show that foreign affiliates in Ireland source actually less locally compared to OECD countries uh, on average. So Ireland is here more on the right with, with, with less uh, domestic sourcing. And this is true, but we also have to be fair to say that this is very common among small and open economies such as Belgium and the Netherlands. And of course that relates to the market size. So if you have a smaller size for production of inputs, then of course the foreign affiliates will also rely on, on importing some of these inputs. And that's the whole point about global value chains and, and its advantages. So of course we wanna have more local linkages, but it's all relative to, to what the market is actually, what, to what extent it makes sense in a, in a given market. Uh, having said that, we, we do see growing uh, local linkages in Ireland in recent years. And again, we are impressed and, and, and very positive that IDA has put that also into strategy to enhance coordination efforts with Enterprise Ireland, which is covering more the domestic economy to foster more linkages. And again, we have continuation of such type of work at the OECD and we stand ready to, to, to engage uh, along these lines uh, going forward. Now, let me go to the last slide, which is on, on labor mobility. We have seen impressive labor mobility since uh, 2008 in the post crisis period of the last crisis, where we see, for example, more than one out of every four employees did move from a foreign firm to a domestic firm or into self-employment in Ireland. One in three startup founders has previously worked in a foreign firm. And one out of two inventors, patent owners, has changed ownership, has changed employer, sorry, uh, at least uh, once over the study period. And again, that's a, an FDI story because most of the inventors uh, are related to foreign affiliates in, in Ireland. Next slide, please. So let me conclude with this. We, we have really identified considerable direct FTI impacts in Ireland. We have identified important potential for FTI spillovers in Ireland. And I, I now really look forward to have an interesting discussion today and to continue working with you, Martin, and the whole IDA team going forward. Thanks again to IIEA, IDA, for this great collaboration. Thank you very much uh, for that. Lots of lots of material uh, there, uh, Martin. Just an initial question, follow up question from the closing part of your your discussion. There, you mentioned that one in three people who've been involved, who've started up their own business, have previously worked in a foreign multinational. Do you? Is there comparative data? Uh, do you have any idea how that compares with other countries? At Martin in Paris, one for you. Sure, sure, I can go. Thanks a lot for this this question, Dan. Yeah, no, I think it, um, we 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 haven't done or we haven't been able to to do a cross country study on this. But I, I recently came across a, a EU study that was actually published. Um, it's not from the EU itself, but it covers EU countries uh, that that looks at labour mobility uh, in the EU and and uh, it does show significant labour mobility. Uh, in many of the EU countries, I think Ireland comes out as, as having seen a particularly high level of labor mobility, but, but let me confirm that. But I think maybe one additional point here to make is that this whole point about labor mobility has to also be taken with a pinch of salt because, of course, it, in a given market, you have a limited amount of, of, skilled, uh, of skilled labor. And, and when a foreign firm comes in and there, there is scarce amounts of, of this skilled labor, it also means that that, that, uh, that, that labor may actually be pulled to, to, um, to foreign firms away from the domestic economy. So that could also be a risk for the domestic firm economy um, in, in some of the cases. And that study actually showed that 
this this happens particularly if absorptive capacities are are not as high. So in that case, it is a high risk for for the domestic economy, and also it it is a high risk if the labor market is less is less, you know, flexible in the sense that that you can actually see uh, labor mobility happening uh, very uh, very very commonly so so that's just an, another aspect to the labor mobility story yeah. thank you okay thank you um a question from stephen byrne on um the productivity gap that uh, gap you highlighted there between employment and and uh, value added um he wonders is um it, it could this be misleading and he, he raises the issue of companies moving intellectual property assets to ireland um any thoughts uh, around that any of you, Martin in Dublin or Anna, anybody? Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, well, listen, I, I think uh, Martin Bimberger is probably a better place to, to uh, respond given, you know, the methodology that he used. But um, I, I think what uh, my reading of the report suggests is that, you know, the OECD have done a good job of separating out the various strata of companies um, here in terms of uh, the productivity gap. And they've also, I think, uh, and Martin can correct me if I'm wrong, they have also removed outliers from the, the data set to ensure that there aren't any uh, anomalies. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what the data shows is a, a small group of highly productive um, uh, companies. Uh, and they, I think, predominantly reside probably in the technology sector and within manufacturing and the pharmaceutical uh, sector. And then we have a second strata of uh, companies who uh, coalesce around uh, a, a median, and then we have a long tail of companies uh, at, at various levels of productivity. And I suppose from an IDA perspective, it is primarily about bringing probably that long tail and those companies with lower levels of productivity whom are, are at risk, frankly, their, you know, their business model is at risk, up to the median, rather than trying to ensure that everybody is uh, at the frontier of um, productivity. And I would suggest that a similar approach is required with uh, domestic uh, companies, where we're not trying to ensure that domestic companies um, become, you know, uh, productivity at the uh, uh, productivity frontier companies. We're trying to ensure that everybody gets uh, to the kind of medium. But maybe Martin is better placed, uh, given that it's his methodology. Martin. Well, thanks a lot, Martin. Thanks a lot, Dan, for this question. Yes, indeed, we 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 tried to kind of eliminate the outliers, and as I showed in the graph, where we have the ninety-five percentile uh, productivity foreign firms in Ireland. Uh, they're so much more productive uh, than the rest, and and but are actually kind of a, a small fraction of all foreign firms operating in Ireland. So we we try to not focus so much on those. And you're right; those are definitely uh, they they have. It's also related to to the fact that they have high high profits in Ireland, and 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 and, and that relates to intangible assets that that are kind of placed in Ireland which which makes a lot of sense I think we we I mean one we, we do have a, a, another study uh, that looks at the intangible assets and, and if, if the person that asks the question is interested in that I think we're soon ready to to share that with, with with the audience here which which does provide some more insights in terms of um, the role of foreign firms in global value chains in terms of how much is is uh, intangible capital and where it goes and where it's positioned and so on, but um, it's true. Like when we look at the productivity gaps and and we see very high differences, it, there is a risk when we aggregate things that we we do cover some of these firms that um, that are just like way more productive because they, they have certain operations that and 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 also the profits being based in Ireland. So so. Uh, I think uh, I think that's uh, that's a, an important point to mention here as well. I think if you go back to the analysis on productivity and dynamics. We saw, for example, in the uh, information and communication sector, we we do actually see quite some dynamics in terms of productivity growth of the lower of the lower productivity firms, and I think it, it's really. There and Martin said that it's 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 interesting for IDA, I guess, to look at how can these firms become more 
productive in Ireland as well. And also how can these firms actually link with the domestic economy where maybe the gap is, is, is a little bit lower. So it's true that the agri numbers that we show in terms of the gap, yeah, they can be questioned, but, but then we have very detailed analysis in the report that, that gives some more light on those things. In terms of that super productive 5% of companies, in, in numerical terms, how many companies are we talking about? Uh, well, for that, I couldn't, I, I cannot answer that question, but, but maybe Martin has a sense of that. But Yeah, I'm sure there's not an exact number to hand, but uh, Martin in Dublin, do you, would you have a sense of, are we talking? You're, in the, you're, in, you're in the tens, I would suggest, um, uh, Dan. Okay, great, thanks. So now, inevitably, there's, there's a couple on tax. Um, Aidan Regan asks whether the OECD has tried to disentangle uh, tax strategies uh, of global multinational enterprises um, in this data, particularly when measuring productivity and profit. Mm. Dan, maybe I can try to answer that. I, I think that in the, in the OECD, we are doing a big effort on tax and multinational. You know that this one is the BEPS project of tax avoidance. And I think that this project has, has a big impact on the, on the behavior of multinational. But at the, at the investment, in the investment division, we also uh, have the FDA statistic and we try also to, we develop the concept of special purpose entities or that right now also is in the IMF uh, balance of payment and uh, there is a review of uh, right now of the benchmark and I think that this will be adapted by anyone. That means that uh, we are trying to measure what activities is a real FBI activity and what activity goes through uh, these uh, countries for uh, tax uh, reasons. Um, but, but, it, but it's true that to answer the question and to link this issue of tax with uh, the productivity and labor, you need to link this FDI with other databases because the FDI is a little more aggregated. And um, we haven't done that for this work. We analyze the, the multinationals in Ireland that are, of course, there is an issue of taxes and going for taxes and higher profit are there thanks to the taxes, but doesn't mean that they, they but it's not special purpose entities, are entities that are multinational that are creating value in Ireland. Uh, of course, the high profit, and as was mentioned by Martin in his presentation, how much this profit stay in Ireland and re is reinvesting or go back to the countries is another question. Uh, that means that, yes, we are working on that. In this particular uh, report, we analyze a little this issue, but, uh, but uh, making a disentangle the, what goes to productivity means a little more work and linking this work that we are doing with other databases. And we're working on that. Yeah, Dan, if I might just come in there and, and uh, you know, just uh, agreeing obviously with Anna, um, but, and, uh, you know, unsurprising, you know, that uh, we're in Ireland and that we're talking about FDI and that tax uh, comes up, but this is an issue, obviously, uh, you know, how you measure FDI and, uh, and the impact of um, you know, tax policy on FDI, and indeed how you just measure FDI full stop. This is an issue for all my peers uh, across the globe and something we discuss, um, you know, at intervals when we get together. And, you know, uh, obviously financial flows may flatter some uh, countries uh, un un undoubtedly, and, and we, ha we have to acknowledge that. But that is exactly why, you know, in Ireland we focus on uh, tangible uh, measures of FDI. So, you know, the things that are, I think, indisputable are the expenditure of foreign multinationals within Ireland on payroll, on services, on manufacturing, uh, you know, and I gave this earlier over 25 billion. The numbers of people employed in multinationals, uh, you know, which to my mind is probably a, a really good measure because it means you have to have substance here. So, you know, the 257,000 people are actually employed day to day, uh, not to mention the significant um, uh, extra impact in indirect employment, you know, of over 400,000. And we use a very low multiplier in Ireland of about 1.8, and it is probably in truth much higher. The corporation tax, the actual tax take from these companies, uh, you know, it, it, it is a measure of how much uh, it, it, it is here, as is the income tax take. So there are a lot of measures uh, which we can use to try to, you know, determine what the substance is on the ground. 
Uh, and I, I think it would, it's worthwhile maybe concentrating on those things, as well as obviously, uh, you know, we welcome the work by the OECD on looking at wh what, you know, is happening in special purpose, in purpose entities and how they might have an impact. Thanks. A couple of questions coming in on um, sourcing, multinational sourcing uh, uh, materials and services from the local economy. Louise Brennan uh, from Trinity College, let me read her point. As highlighted, Ireland is highly integrated into global value chains. As also mentioned, there is a low level of sourcing by foreign companies from indigenous companies. Is there a tension between Ireland's degree of integration into global value chains and the need for greater local sourcing uh, by foreign companies? I think, uh, Martin and Paris, you, you've sort of addressed that uh, in your presentation, but you might want to go into it in a little more detail. And Adrian Hurley has a similar one. Um, is there any way of knowing if the low linkages between foreign companies and domestic resources are due to the non-availability of rel relative inputs in Ireland, or is there a big opportunity to increase this over the shorter term? So Martin and Paris, maybe, uh, it's, uh, it's relevant to you. Sure. No, thanks a lot for these questions and, and let me answer the first one, but maybe actually Martin it will be better place to, to answer the second one because because uh, he's probably talking a lot to the investors and, and knows their concerns in terms of availability or non-availability of, of inputs uh, in, in the domestic economy. No, but just uh, I think what we identify is is indeed that that the sourcing, the share of sourcing uh, of, from local firms is fairly low compared to other OECD countries. But as I mentioned before, this is very common among small and open economies in, in the EU. And, and you would see that in, in Switzerland, in Belgium, in the Netherlands and so on. And why is that? Again, it is it's not that the inputs are not available, but in some cases it makes sense that they're not available because it's just a small market. And in a small market, you cannot expect that, that all inputs can be produced of the, of the, in the right quality as a, a global lead firm that is, is producing in Ireland uh, would expect so. So in that sense, I think we, we, we would never want to see like the highest shares of, of input sourcing in Ireland. I think that wouldn't be a, an optimal outcome ultimately. And by the way, the whole story of, of global value chain integration is indeed the fact that there are different locations in the world that are specialized and better placed to produce certain uh, inputs and that's why we, we do want to source from them uh, in, in yeah across the world to have like, optimal um, ways of, of producing uh, and so on so but having said that of course ideally it would be good to 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 have strong linkages with the domestic economy still and, and, and of course, we, we do want to look into opportunities for foreign firms in Ireland to, to potentially source from local firms if the inputs are available. And, and, and there, I understand from, from recent IDA discussions uh, with colleagues from, from IDA that, that uh, in, the, in, the, in the more recent years, these, these linkages um, have actually increased when, 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 when they look at, the, at, at their recent statistics. It's true that our data is a little bit dated now. We, we have been looking at 2006 to 16, and uh, according to recent data from IDA, the, the, the very low, I mean, the fairly low share has actually been increased in um, more recently. But but maybe I hand over to Martin in terms of like, yeah, are they not available or not? I think we haven't done interviews with the firms themselves, so I think maybe you have some perspective on that. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, as Martin has uh, outlined, you know, actually in the data set that Martin and the years that he, he and his colleagues looked at, um, you know, lo uh, local sourcing kind of stalled somewhat. It has increased since, and, you know, we can see that in the economic impact uh, figures. Um, but again, I think it is worth reflecting that we are similar to other small OECD uh, economies in terms of the level of sourcing that there is in Ireland. There has been a huge focus on global sourcing and trying to link Enterprise Ireland uh, and, and, and Indigenous companies with multinationals. Uh, there are challenges in that. Um, I don't think all the challenges relate to just the availability. 
And, you know, global sourcing also suggests that, you know, companies are looking for companies that can supply across the globe and scale of Irish companies in some instances is, is an issue. And there are also, as we have highlighted, productivity gaps. And we need multinationals uh, uh, pr procuring from companies that are highly uh, productive. So the more we bridge those product productivity gaps, the more sourcing that could happen here. And I think in that regard, you know, one part of the new strategy that we have to try to build those linkages with uh, between uh, Irish companies and multinationals is the clustering effect, because we believe it will not just fostering uh, foster global sourcing, but also lots of other spillover effects. So that's going to be, I think, a signature uh, initiative in the new strategy. Okay, thanks. So there's a lot of questions here, and maybe for the final five minutes, we might look at uh, more forward-looking ones. Um, there's one on tax from um, on the BEPS process, which Anna, I might send give to you. But just uh, one of the first questions we got in was from Paul Sweeney, um, who says, "Martin, what will the almost inevitable regulation and perhaps a breakup of the tech companies by the US and EU?" mean for Ireland. So uh, what's happening in the with the big tech giants and how could that potentially uh, affect Ireland? I presume you're sending that my way, Dan. Uh, so I, I think, listen, uh, Paul, I, I, I'm not sure the breakup of the firms is inevitable. I think the increased regulation is probably almost uh, uh, certain and, and increased uh, oversight. And I, I think it, it, it we'll then have to see, I suppose, how that uh, shakes out and you know, there will still, and you know, we're, we're largely talking about technology firms uh, in this vein, and obviously there will still be a demand for technology, there will still be growth in the technology area. Those companies will, whether they are still uh, monoliths or they are disaggregated, will still need to service their clients from somewhere. And, you know, our job is obviously to monitor uh, the progress of those and make sure that they're servicing whatever they look like, that they're providing that service from Ireland. Um, okay, let me go over to Alan Duke's question uh, about the, the BEPS process. Any action to rationalize international tax relations will be incomplete without the participation of the United States and Caribbean administrations. What are the prospects of real participation by those administrations in OECD actions? That's from Alan Duke's, a former finance minister uh, at work to help. I'm, I'm not the, the tax expert, I have to say, but uh, but I know that uh, right now the efforts of BEPS is implementation and implementation. This is what they are working on, and uh, and uh, and I think that the US was a little disentangled, but but I think that right now it's starting to be engaged again. The Caribbean are more difficult because of the capacity, uh, but uh, they are also. Uh, I completely agree. With the, the, these countries need to be engaged, but I would say that the United States at the technical level has been engaged in the implementation part. And I know that right now are also doing extra effort with these Caribbean countries, uh, but, but I agree. And, and also in terms of measurement, I think that the special purpose entities that we are working on, uh, but the United States has this kind of uh, statistic, but we need also other kind of a statistic to, uh, to understand better what is going on in the world in general. And uh, this new update that also the IMF is doing, I think that will go in, in that right uh, direction. Dan, if I can say something before, uh, it's also there are a lot of questions about the linkage and, and the FBI and the linkage with the, the impact on employment, the impact on wages, and there is something about that, and in the regional impact, uh, how to also improve more the spillover in the domestic economies. And, and I think that, yes, this is one report that is moving the agenda. And I think that, of course, the strategy is broader and then it's tackling better all these kind of issues. But just want to say what I said at the beginning, we are developing right now this kind of FDA qualities uh, policy toolkit because exactly most of the countries are asking how we strengthen these linkages with the sustainable impact. It's not just to attract more investment, but it's attract investment that have a positive impact in society. And the society is the regions because regions are lacking behind. The society is small, medium enterprises because you want them also to benefit from the global market. And uh, the society is people that are skilled, that how you put more skills there and more wages there. And I mean, that this is a, a, a demand that I, I think that this is something that is not just for Ireland, I think that it's for 
all countries, OECD and non-OECD countries. So for this reason, we are trying to focus our work right now there on the policy mix and the institution because one agency and in that I think that the strategy of that Martin Hanna presented is very good because in a way you, you will not do it by yourself you need to do it with other agencies and the linkage with other policies. Okay, thank you. Well, look, we've come to the end uh, of the event uh, of our hour. Um, I, let me apologize to the many people whose questions and points I didn't get to uh, to, to put to the panel. Uh, we've had hundreds of people on this uh, at this event, so really just too many to, to get through. We could have gone on for at least another half an hour to deal with all the questions. But let me, on behalf of the Institute, thank uh, both of uh, both the IDA Ireland and the OECD for joining us on this event. I think it's been a very uh, interesting one and uh, the report will give uh, plenty of food for thought for, uh, for those who, who tuned in today and others more widely. So with that, uh, thank you all for participating. Thank, uh, thank the audience for joining. Uh, wish you all a good afternoon. Thanks.